Hey, what's up? I'm William Beckett. I'm Adam Siska. We're from the Academy Is, and here are 10 things you do, did not know about us recording almost here. The first thing is... Uh, we actually recorded and wrote almost here with the track listing in mind, so like we basically wrote all those songs in order with them in mind to um, go that way on the album. I think it was obvious that Attention was going to be the album opener. You know, that was kind of a... That was kind of a no-brainer for us. Yeah. And then... And uh, track from, two, we kind of wanted something that was like palm muted, locked down, you know. We just basically copied the vibe of like records that we liked and what we thought a record should be because I mean, we didn't have any real experience, so... Yeah, all we knew is that we wanted it to be something uh, that we loved the front to back, not just select singles. The second thing would be that we lived at a place called the Daisy Inn in St. Cloud, Florida, and we made the record. Uh, there was cockroaches, and uh, a hole in the door of our room, just about the size for like somebody put a shotgun right through it, you know. Uh, so was that real, was crazy. It, yeah, it was, it was real classy. There was a fire there, and then the, <clears throat> the lady who was like the groundskeeper had like an undershave. You know, which was kind of a Phil culturally <laughs> interesting thing. Uh, it was a strange place to make a record. Uh, I've never been back, but someday I think I'd like to go revisit it if it's still there. The first the pressing of the artwork, the CD, was the wrong color scheme. So like the first few thousand albums that were pressed by Feel By Ramen were the wrong color. It was lighter in color, so if you see that, you know that somebody like bought it right away, a true fan, so. It's the OG pressing. We were kind of bummed about it, though. I remember we got the CD packaging in the mail, you know, and opened it up and it was We like, spent a lot of time, you know, like, you know. on the art concept with the artists. Like, we spent a lot of time on it, so like, yeah, we were bummed. Yeah. <laughs> but in hindsight, it's like, hey, we're it talking like about It looked like peaches and cream more so than like the sunset is what we were going for. There was a record that came out while we were recording the album, which was the Hot Fuss record by The Killers. And uh, Mike stole my CD. Yeah. So yeah. I, I remember we like went to Orlando and we were so stoked because like we were huge fans and still are of The Killers, and it was their first record. And Adam, he pointed up the 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 dough the dough for it, and then yeah. like first thing, Mike snatches it and he's like, "This is mine." I said, "Give it back," and he said, "You don't even like music," <laughs> and took it. So that was fun. Speaking of Mike, uh, another fun fact. While, while we were writing the album, Mike and I lived in an apartment together with two of our other friends, Tony and Johnny. And we were also working at The Gap at the time. Not together, actually. It was strange, because he worked there and then quit shortly after. And then I worked there and then quit shortly after. So, but. Retail just wasn't for us, I don't think. I learned how to play bass when we were making the record. I was like 15 years old and didn't really know what I was doing. So I kind of uh, figured it out as we went. You were natural though, like you had the natural th thing that like people don't have. I I'm kissing his ass right now. Well, I think what I figured out on the record was that if you listen to the kick drum <clears throat> on the record, the bass is very much locked in with that. So that was basically the rule was Follow the note that the guitar is playing at the time that the kick drum's playing. Voila. Then you got the bass. And you got like a properly played bass. So that's how you can learn, kids. Another thing that the people don't really realize um, was how quickly we recorded the record. So once we got down to Florida, we didn't have a lot of time before Warp Tour was going to start for us that year. So we had to finish the record in three weeks. So it was like every day, you know. Actually, it wasn't Warp Tour. It was uh, the Believers Never Die Tour with Fall Out Boy, Armor for Sleep, that's and right. Bayside. See, yeah. that's why he's here. The better memory. Yeah. But um, yeah, we had to get the hell out of there. So, three weeks we finished the acoustic guitars on the record, like right before we got in the van and left. We went straight to tour. Bill here smoked pot for the first time ever and wrote down and out. Yeah, it was. And then I remember, didn't you find out? And you were like. What did you do? Like you I was were, bummed about it. We were so we were, bummed. We, we weren't hippies. But, but I was like, we were meant well, to be check out the song I just wrote. Yeah. Um, 
that was <laughs> yeah that was at the apartment the experimental phase <laughs> yeah. oh mike and i got in a fight in which i quit the band during the making of the record and it was because i keep in mind we were 15 and like 17 18 years old something like that and uh I came out of the bathroom and I had just poured myself a bowl of Apple Jacks prior to going to the bathroom, letting it kind of stew in the milk for a second because that's how I like it. And I came back out and Mike had his dirty paws in my Apple Jacks, taking a handful of it. So I bopped him out over of the, the milk, head. right? I hit him over the head, and uh, a full-on brawl occurred after it. And I quit the band, and uh, I was pouting in the hotel room. Didn't go to the studio that day, and Mike came back in the middle of the night grabbed me, took me to the studio, and Bill had just written and recorded the vocals for The Phrase That Pays. So I decided not to quit the band. So. Thankfully, I wrote that one that day. Don't touch the Apple Jacks, though. Don't, yeah. Just lay off the Apple Jacks. Yeah. The very last thing that we wrote, and this kind of goes in line with us writing the album in order, I was really struggling with the very end of Almost Here, and I was, I, and I was pouting, too. Cause I was like, I, you know, I was like feeling bad for myself. Like nothing I was writing was good for the end. And uh, this is the end of the record. It has to be like something epic, you know. And we were re really inspired by Saves the Day, and they always ended their albums with like an epic song. I was in my head, and then Mike it came into the van that we were renting, and uh, we sat there and like talked about like what we like what the point of the ending is, and then we wrote it together and like. 10 minutes and then it was fine. But I, I remember it just being like the biggest burden ever on my shoulders to just like, no, I'm gonna like let everyone down. But there's, it, there's, it a, out. there's a line at the end of the song that chants, this isn't like us anyway. And I think Mike, who's European, had a little bit of language barrier there and he, his idea was this isn't like us very much, which I guess is actually proper English, but I mean, it doesn't it, really no. sound good. <laughs> It's not, it's not technically proper, yeah. but um, <laughs> I knew what he meant, so I switched it, and it worked out. Yeah. What, we have not been back since. Right, have you been back there? Daisy Inn? Uh, no. No. I just said that. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't listening to you. <laughs>